Good morning and welcome back to our Wednesday study in the Gospel of John. We come this morning to a well-known section of this Gospel, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. We'll be in John chapter 4 verses 1 through 26. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, that would be a good thing to do. This particular text, verses 1 through 26 of chapter 4, is another example, just like the encounter with Nicodemus, which illustrates how Jesus knew all men. You may recall back in chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, it said this, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And uh, the story of Nicodemus, as well as in chapter 3, as well as the story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4, illustrate how Jesus was able to know people and... Because of that, he was able to deal with them in some very good ways. And we have another example of that in this particular lesson. There are some similarities, of course, between the encounter with Nicodemus and this particular encounter with the Samaritan woman. Both individuals, we see, are confused in a religious sense. Uh, Nicodemus wasn't understanding some things, and surely this woman has some problems as well in that arena. So they were alike in that way. In both instances, Jesus was able to look into their hearts and discern their real need. For Nicodemus, it was the fact that he needed to be born again, and Jesus honed in on that in his discussion with him. And in this particular case, there's some problems in this woman's life that Jesus gently works to bring to the surface and, and deal with them. But in other ways, Nicodemus and this Samaritan woman couldn't have been more different. Obviously, one was a man and the other was a woman. One was a Jew and the other was a Samaritan. One was a person of high moral standing, a leader among his people. That was Nicodemus the Pharisee, a member likely of the Sanhedrin. This particular individual most likely didn't enjoy much respect in her community, even among her own people. The success of Jesus' mission causes him to move back into the northern part of Israel, into the region of Galilee. That's what we're going to see here in John chapter 4 in the first six verses. Let's take a look at those verses before we get into the, the latter section. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, reads this way. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So the success of Jesus and his disciples in their ministry in reaching people had not only attracted the attention of John's disciples, we studied about that back in chapter 3, verses 25 through 30, and there John's disciples come to, to John and say, you know what, Jesus' group is reaching more people than we are, what are we going to do about that? And John, of course, sits them down and says, you know what, Jesus it must increase and I must decrease. So, you know, that was attracting the attention of other groups, but it was also becoming a concern for the Pharisees. You know, in the early stages of Jesus's ministry, you know, he was just another itinerant rabbi that probably wasn't on the radar, but as time goes on, Jesus attracts greater and greater crowds, and that starts to become a concern for them. This drawing of the attention of the Jewish leadership was a far more troubling matter than catching the attention of John's disciples because it was not the right time in the ministry of Jesus to have a major confrontation with these religious leaders. That time would come, but at this particular point, that's not, uh, you know, it's too early for that to happen. So wisely, Jesus here moves out of Judea into an area where he would, there would be less chance for trouble. But all is not lost, even if, you know, you're moving away from the hot spot into another part. Uh, this trip north takes Jesus through 
Samaritan territory, and it gives him a chance to take his message to them. In particular, as we see here, Jesus is going to meet a Samaritan woman, and through a series of appeals, Jesus brings her to realize some things. Number one, he gets her to see her own spiritual need. He talks about some sin problems she has. But even more importantly, he's going to to help her to realize that he was the Messiah who could meet those needs. Uh, so Jesus reaches out to this woman, as we're going to see in verses 13 and following, in five different ways, and then ends with a rather surprise announcement to her. So let's look at these five appeals to the Samaritan woman in succession and see what how Jesus works in this situation. First of all, we have appeal number one, and that's how Jesus appeals to her sympathy, verses 13 through 15. John chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Jesus has made his way, way north into Galilee. It says, There came a woman of Samaria. Uh, he's on his way to Galilee, going through Samaria. It says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I thought this morning as I was going over these notes in my head that, you know, social distancing has been around for quite some time. We find it going on in the first century between the Jews and the Samaritans. It's not because of a, a virus, but it's because of some... Uh, ethnic and racial things going on that these people just didn't care to spend, uh, yeah, for the most part, didn't care to spend much time around one another. But Jesus doesn't have a problem with that. Rather than beginning here by saying that he had something that she needed, which Jesus certainly did have something, and he'll get to that. But before that, he asked her for something that he needed, and that was a drink of water. Sometimes the quickest way to open a spiritual door, to break down a barrier in a relationship, is to ask for help or a favor. This catches the woman off guard, of course, and causes her to begin a dialogue with Jesus. You know, she probably is just trying to keep herself aloof here, just get my water and get home. I know what I'm going to hear from this Jew. If, if a conversation struck up, you know, I'm not going to hear anything good. But the response of Jesus here, or the request of Jesus, catches her off guard, and, and that begins a dialogue. I'm reminded of the method of the Apostle Paul later in the Gospel, or in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. There's where Paul talks about his willingness to be flexible in efforts to spread, spread the gospel. He says, Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as those under the law, though not myself being under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I became all things to all men, so that I may all, by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. So, you know, Paul, if you will, is following the lead of, of his Savior, of his Master, and in, in being flexible enough to, to uh, maybe appear vulnerable. We're not talking here about being fake. I don't think Jesus is is being fake or, you know, uh, trying to be uh, sly in, in some sort of way at all. But he is putting himself in a position of vulnerability. He's asking a Samaritan woman for a favor. And uh, Paul talks that he was willing to make himself vulnerable as well. So that's appeal number one. Jesus appeals to her sympathy. I need something and you can help me. And that causes, again, the discussion to go on. Now we've got appeal number two. Appeal number two is verses 10 through 12. And we find Jesus appealing to her curiosity. All right, I just see in my notes, I think we were talking, I misread that. This first section, appeal number one, was verses seven through nine. I think I said 13 through 15. Sorry about that. Anyway, get back on track. 
Appeal number two is verses 10 through 12. John chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Jesus here appeals to her curiosity. Starts by appealing to her sympathy. Now he piques her curiosity. Let's read verses 10 through 12. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? So after catching her attention, Jesus hides her curiosity by mentioning that he had something she needed. Started by saying, you know, I have something that I need and you can help me. Now he's raising your curiosity by saying, I have something you need. Two words, I think, in particular in these, particular, these verses catch your interest. The one is, a, one is gift and the other is living water. You start talking about a gift, that causes people's people to pay attention, right? If somebody says, I have a gift for you, that catches my attention, right? Everyone likes to receive a gift. So that plays into this conversation by getting her to think about some things. And then this idea of living water as well. Uh, you know, in that culture, you got your water from a well. It was work to go walk to the well and carry the, the water back. And so, uh, you know, to, to find a, a well... Uh, living water in this particular culture meant running water, fresh water. Water in a well just kind of sits there and and uh, it's not living in that sense. So uh, she begins to surmise there's something different about this particular Jewish man. As I said in the beginning, she probably expected to hear something very, very negative from Jesus. And that's not turning out this way. So her curiosity is raised here by way of Jesus's statements and questions to her. There's something different about this particular Jewish man, and that gives an opportunity for the dialogue to go on. Appeal number three. Here we come to verses 13 through 15. Appeal number three is the, the fact that Jesus appeals to her physical needs. You know, he was vulnerable in the start by saying, I have a need. I have a physical need. I need a drink. Hot day out, been walking. Jesus now makes an appeal to her physical needs. There's something she needs as well. Verses 13 through 15 read this way. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. And I can imagine you know, him just maybe motioning with his hand to the, the mouth of the, of the well. But, verse 14, Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and nor have to come all this way here to draw. So that, you know, this offer of living water that satisfies uh, thirst and, and is always available. Uh, this, Jesus further describes this living water of which he speaks here. Again, it's a it's uh, something that takes care of thirst forever. You don't have to go anywhere to draw it. Uh, that's physically appealing. It was tiring to do what she was having to do. This creates a desire within this particular woman for the water Jesus was offering. She came to draw uh, water from the well, and now she's thinking about a different kind of water. Jesus began this encounter by asking for water. Now, guess what? The woman is asking him. For water and Jesus has this amazing way of, of gently bringing someone to a point where they start to realize their own needs. Appeal number four, verses 16 through 19. John chapter 4, 16 through 19. Jesus here is going to appeal to her conscience. So now we're getting into some deeper matters. Up to this point, it's been pretty surface, just talking about some phys physical things. Jesus introduces some spiritual matters. But notice here how Jesus appeals to her conscience. Jesus says, he says, he said to her, verse 16, go and call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husbands for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you have now, the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So at this point, Jesus now deals with the problem in her life, which will keep this woman from sharing in the living water. 
He's made an offer of that, but there's some things in the way, just like they're in the way for all of us initially. And the thing keeping this woman from sharing in the living water Jesus offers is, is a sin problem in her life. This revelation had to come as quite a shock to this woman. You know, chances are her relationships over the time had become known in the town she lived in. You know, she was that woman who, who uh, had several husbands, and you can imagine perhaps how she was treated for all of that. But for a stranger to know the, the details of her life was quite a shock, something out of, out of the ordinary. And once again, now she knows she's dealing with someone who is more than just your average Joe. You know, she has no idea at this point. She's actually talking to the Messiah. Jesus will get to the point to reveal that before we're, we're done here in this text. But at this point, you know, bit by bit, she's starting to come to the realization that something is different here. This isn't just your average Jewish man. It's reminiscent for me of what we studied back in John chapter 1, verses 45 through 49. We recall that in that first chapter, Jesus is starting to gather disciples to mentor and, and teach to carry on his work. And what happened between Jesus and Nathanael? John chapter 1, verse 45, it says, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found the one of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, I, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So in like manner, Nathanael, as he interacted with Jesus, came to realize, realization that uh, this wasn't an ordinary human being. This is somebody who had knowledge that no one else could have. He makes a profession here that Jesus is the Messiah. This Samaritan woman isn't at that point yet, but she's starting to realize something's different here. So Jesus has been appealing to her conscience here. He brings up this sin in her life. Appeal number five of the five, verses 20 through 24. John chapter 4, 20 through 24. Jesus here now will appeal to her religious misunderstanding. So again, the, the discussion is, has began in a very physical sense, and it's worked its way. Uh, to a, a deeper spiritual sense, and that's by design here with Jesus working with, with her. Verses 20 through 24 says, Our fathers worshipped, this is the woman speaking, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the, is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, there are at least two common explanations for this sudden change in subjects. And maybe you caught that as we read on here. One minute Jesus is, uh, the, the woman is dealing with Jesus and Jesus uh, confronts her about some sin in her life and all of a sudden the whole discussion changes and now we're talking about worship matters and where you ought to worship and how and all of that. How do you, why the big change? Again, a couple of reasons Bible students offer. First of all, some would say, well, she's trying to deliberately change the subject to avoid the examination of sin in her life, and that's certainly a possibility. That's human nature, isn't it? Most of us, when we're confronted with a problem in our life, will try to deflect that or change the subject or move on to something else that's perhaps not so painful for us. So that's one possibility. There is another possibility, though. Some suggest that this woman was in, realizes that she's in the presence of a prophet, and she sincerely wanted to know some answers, right? All of a sudden, you realize, hey, I'm talking to somebody here who knows things that he shouldn't be able to know, and and these other questions have been burning a hole in my mind. I, I need to know some. So here's a chance. I'm not going to waste it now. I'm going to ask some other things I've been worried about. 
So that's a possibility as well. And I don't know that we know for sure from the text which way to go on that. But regardless of the reason, Jesus takes the opportunity here. Or for whatever reason, the woman brings it up. Jesus takes the opportunity to teach her about true worship. True worship in the New Covenant won't be tied, according to Jesus, to any particular physical location. Now, you realize under the Old Covenant, God had specific places where he was to, to be to be worshipped and sacrifices were to be made, and there were trouble all over that. So that, that was certainly true at one stage in God's working with man. But Jesus says things are going to be different now. Worship won't be tied to Jerusalem or Samaria or, or this mountain or that mountain. You're missing the point. According to Jesus here, true worship will be spiritual in nature, not physical, because God himself is spirit. You know, the Jews and for probably in many measures the Samaritans were used to uh, you know physical things associated with worship, but now uh, you know, things are going to be more spiritual in nature. Not that you know it wasn't a spiritual offering, even the animal sacrifices. There was a spiritual uh, part to that, but um, in a larger sense, beginning with Jesus and and the new covenant, uh, it's going to be more spiritual in nature. Also, true worship, according to Jesus, as we learn in these verses, will be according to the truth and reality revealed through the life and words of Jesus as well. So again, Jesus answering some questions here, a diversion, if you will, from perhaps his real intent, answering some questions on that she realizes here. But we finish up the text in verses 25 and 26. And we get to the real, we call it here the announcement, the big surprise for the woman. You know, she's been, Jesus has led her to the point to realize perhaps, you know, things are different here with this, this man. Verses 25 and 26 says, The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. So she's the one that brings up the idea of the Messiah, but notices Jesus' announcement to her in verse 26. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Or he says, I am the Messiah of whom you speak. It's easy for me to imagine the woman's head, you know, even up to this point is starting to be spinning by this time, right? She's hearing some things that are incredible. And all she can say is the Messiah will explain all of this when he comes. And then Jesus drops the bombshell, I am the Messiah. We can note some important concepts from this text, and I think it has some bearing on perhaps our efforts to build relationships with the world around us. You know, we live in a world and we're surrounded by people who certainly need the Lord. And uh, what are some things maybe we can learn as, uh, to help us as we interact with those around us probably won't be at a physical well like it was with Jesus and this woman, but maybe around the coffee table or something like that. First concept we can talk about is the fact that Jesus brought this woman gradually to an understanding of her spiritual need. Now, I suppose there are times, and probably rarer than not, when you know, maybe you only have five minutes to share the gospel with someone, so you got to get right to the point. I'm not saying those times don't come up, but by and f by far, I believe the uh, there's there's time to to build a relationship. Most often, where we where we don't have to, you know, come in with all guns blazing. Jesus brought this woman gradually to an understanding of her spiritual need. I don't know how long this discussion. It wasn't like it took hours to talk about these things, but Jesus starts uh, in, a, in a different way. We could mention the things Jesus, the ways Jesus didn't start here, right? Jesus didn't start this discussion with the fact, you know, you can imagine a woman walking up the well, and there sits Jesus, and the first words out of Jesus' mouth weren't things like this. Well, I'm the Messiah, and you need to listen to me. Now, Jesus certainly would have had the right to do that, but he didn't do that. I think, you know, he didn't start so bluntly. Jesus didn't start with something like, well, you're a sinner and you need to repent. So those are a couple possibilities but that Jesus didn't use. Now, are both things true? Was Jesus the Messiah and that, did this woman need to listen to her? Yes. 
Was the woman a sinner and did she need to repent? Yes. So both are true. But are both ways we suggest here the, the best ways to start a discussion? I would say no in most situations. Uh, Jesus worked here within the situation at hand and gently brought this woman to the point where she saw the need for herself. And I would su suggest that that's probably the most effective way to do it. So again, you can come in and be pretty direct and it might drive somebody away or it might close a door that's it's not needful to close. Uh, Jesus here worked within that situation and, and gently come to the point where she saw what she needed to see for herself. And that's, again, usually the best way to do it. If you can get the person you're trying to build a relationship with to, to see it themselves, then you're a long way toward where you need to go. So Jesus brought the woman gradually to an understanding of her spiritual need. That's good. That's a good example. Number two, we see that Jesus here wasn't bound by cultural and ethnic hangups or baggage. Again, this particular area, there were a lot of uh, racial or ethnic uh, division, just like it is in our day yet. I mean, that's, again, part of human nature, but uh, it wasn't different in the first century. But in a lot of Jesus' contemporaries uh, had feelings of distrust and hate for people that were different from them. Wouldn't, you know, the Bible talks about how often Jews would just totally go way out of the way to walk around Samaria. You know, they didn't want to risk having to deal with Samaritans by going directly through. So if they were going north to Galilee, they would sometimes cross the Jordan and go clear out of their way to go around that. Jesus here wasn't bound by the, this cultural ethnic baggage that so many had. Jesus, of course, would have heard about, you know, when he was growing up, probably, you know, growing up where he did in Nazareth, you know, interacting with other people he would had he would have heard all about the no good samaritans right we have a tendency to pass on our biases and he would have heard that growing up but that didn't keep jesus from trying to work with them at all you know jesus didn't see this woman approaching the well and see she was a samaritan and, and walk away jesus certainly did what he could to to help out and finally, as far as a concept that we can learn some things from, is just the idea that the need for living water is a universal need. And Jesus, of course, knew better than anyone else, given his divine mission from his Father to, to come to earth from heaven and, and uh, you know, be that sacrifice for sin. Jesus would have known better than anyone else that you know everyone needs this living water that he's trying to share with with this particular woman and based upon that realization Jesus of course worked to help anyone and that's one thing that stands out in Jesus's ministry we'll see it as we continue to work through this gospel and if you read the rest of the gospels you'll find that same example it didn't matter whether you were the cream of the crop or the the bottom of the barrel and Jesus if if there was a spark of hope and interest in a person's life he would be willing to bend over backwards to work with that person. Uh, you know, Jesus, as it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he says, I came to seek and to save the lost, and that's everyone. So Jesus worked to help anyone, but also in this idea of a need for, a universal need for living water, Jesus worked gently to help anyone. Uh, and that stands out in this text so, so very clearly. So uh, the only time Jesus became more abrupt in dealing with people as when uh, the examples that often happen with the scribes and Pharisees and lawyers where, I mean, Jesus even dealt with them and was willing to help as much as they were willing to be helped. But it was only after they exhibited their hardness of heart that sometimes Jesus became even more direct. Uh, but by and large, uh, Jesus, as it says of him, you know, there wasn't going to extinguish that smoldering wick. If there was a spark of hope in a life, Jesus would gently try to bring a person to see their need. And he certainly does that here. So again, thank you for taking time to, to watch the video and participate in our study through the Gospel of John. We're learning some things about Jesus that are very, very important. And John, of course, you know, as he says later in his Gospel, he's, he's uh, sharing this 
story of Jesus to emphasize the fact that he's the divine son of God. And, and this interaction between Jesus and the Samaritan woman aptly illustrates that very fact that Jesus, uh, you know, has living water to share and he's willing to share with anyone who will, will turn to him. So think about that. If you got some questions or comments, uh, let me know about that and we'll We'll talk about that individually, but thank you for watching. I hope you have a great rest of the week.